Hello, hello. This is Justin Coletti of Sonic Scoop. Thanks for joining me for this week's episode of the Sonic Scoop podcast. If you're here for the live stream premiere, let me know if you can hear me and uh, see me and hear me in the live chat here. And also Cameron of Venus Theory, our special guest today. Cameron, thanks so much for being on the channel. Thanks for having me. Welcome to the, our- the party zone. <laughs> <laughs> All right. I'm going to give uh, just a little bit of accolades for Cameron here. I'm a fan of his YouTube channel. He has got about a quarter million subscribers on his channel. I like watching it. It's one of the most beautifully shot and well-edited channels in the whole music production space. But more importantly than that, for me, is I think he's willing to talk about ideas and realities that a lot of people in this space aren't willing to talk about. Often the kind of economic reality and the emotional factors of making music, whether it's professionally or just as a hobby you really care about. So really excited to dive into some of this stuff with him. Without too much more preamble and an overly long intro for me, Cameron, I want to ask, you recently did a release of yours in April. I believe you went on kind of a a tour of the United Mm, States and created all this beautiful uh, still photography, and you put that along with a music release of yours. And I think it's really good sounding music and really gorgeous stills. But when I compare that to the amount of traction that your YouTube videos get on just music production in general, it doesn't have the same reach. So these are two different games, becoming a educator and a commentator on music production and being a musical artist. It's almost like they are two different paths. And at what point in your life do you decide which of these paths you are going to pursue more earnestly? I don't know that I've ever really decided. I mean, early on in like my late teen years and whatever, I was in bands and did kind of like the more traditional thing. You know, I went on tours and like some of the bands got signed to labels and, you know, played festivals and stuff like that. And I just hated it. (laughs) I've never like been a fan of that. And it, it just wasn't for me. So like, I guess I somewhere in like my early 20s was just over it. Like, you know, tried it, been there, done that. Not my thing. And you know, YouTube was never really a goal of mine either. YouTube was just this thing I decided to start doing one day. And then it just kind of kept going, kept going and eventually, you know, kind of picked up and whatever. And it just became more of like a thing. (laughs) You know, it was like, it was always just the side thing of like, oh, I'm going to make a video about like this obscure, stupid trick on kick drum phase align, you know, whatever. And uh, eventually that kind of picked up. And then, you know, even with where I'm at now, it's like, there is definitely a dichotomy of like what I do or I mean, I guess even beyond that, because it's like, I guess I run like three different businesses technically, (laughs) at least to some degree. And yeah, you know, with the music, it's just not as much of a concern because like if I was out making, you know, awesome lo-fi hip hop or like brutal dubstep or something, I would take that more seriously as like trying to get traction with it on YouTube. But like, I don't care because that's not my goal. Like a lot of my work and a lot of what I do is based on, you know, composition stuff or writing for ads or writing like demo tracks for other things or whatever. And like, that's totally fine. So, (laughs) you know, I'm not, I'm not too angry about like, oh, I don't have 20,000 SoundCloud followers or whatever, because it's like, how many people want to follow someone making 30 second ad spots, (laughs) you know, and like many of my musical heroes have like no Spotify following. They have like no, you know, and some of them, like, they're not even people, you know. But it's just like, I enjoy that side of things infinitely more than like trying to play the, you know, submit hub game, so to speak. I hear you. And that's a game I want to talk to you about because you have great insights into some of the obstacles that confront people when they're releasing music. And I think people could learn a lot from you as far as the kind of, I don't want to say work-life balance of music, but the sanity, insanity balance of leading a creative life. I think that's something (laughs) that you've spoken to very well over the years. So. The reason I wanted to lead with this is because I think some people have taken your recent series that I loved so much about uh, one of the videos was, what's the point of releasing music when nobody cares? And when I told people I was doing this live stream, a lot of people were like, awesome. This is one of my other favorite channels on YouTube. I'm so glad you guys are talking. And then there were a a couple of people who gave me the pushback of, oh, that guy, he just seems depressed all the time. And he only talks about negative things. And he's just mad that he doesn't have a career. I'm like, no, 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 no. If you listen to Cameron's music, which I have, 
his music is absolutely well. I'm like, I, I don't have a career, but like, I've worked with every brand in your DAW a dozen times over. I guarantee yes. it. <laughs> I know it's so it's it's ridiculous to me, and that's why I want to get out there for people for anyone who thinks that oh, Cameron is just a YouTuber. It's like no, go and listen to his tracks on Spotify. They're beautifully produced, and this is a guy who has. I would imagine you have about a, at least a, around a, a decade ish career of kind of making oh, yeah. most of your money yeah. off of just creating music. Yeah, just like it. music and creative stuff. Yeah, because, you know, I did like production and things like that. I worked in like doing some engineering in studios and stuff like that. So yeah, it's been, yeah, I mean, at least a decade, I would guess, of just doing stuff. And, you know, I've had the odd job and stuff here and there, but it was always like a way to finance what else I was doing and what I was like really trying to do. <laughs> so, you know, yeah. I've done a lot of things, <laughs> even though, you know, some people, and, and I feel like that's everything though, you know, like my wife mentions music artists to me all the time and i'm like who and she's yes. like oh they you know 80 billion streams on whatever and it's like oh nice <laughs> it's <laughs> so cool. amazing how little that matters sometimes is i have some artists i've worked with who have hundreds of millions of streams who i've mastered records for and if i bring them up in conversation no one will have ever heard of them but if i mention right. some youtube artist like uh josh turner who has mastering a record for last week um He's a YouTube artist. He has you know, a fraction of the, the streams on Spotify, but people are like, oh, that guy with the YouTube channel. Right. Like they yeah. recognize him. They know him. He's relevant. And there's just a, a deeper sense of interaction that we get through YouTube, which is one of the potential benefits there. Um, one of the potential issues, I think, with streaming music and with having a YouTube channel is that having a YouTube channel or having a popular Spotify channel whichever of these paths you follow, that in and of itself is not especially lucrative. I no. look at a friend of yours, <laughs> someone like Ben Jordan, who also has one of the most gorgeous and insightful YouTube channels out there. And if you look at him as, ha as having a music career and a large number of you know, Spotify listens, he was on the road a lot, which is oh, yeah. my guess is that's one of the things that you hated about your early experiences in pursuing the artist side even more heavily. Oh, for sure. Yeah. Um, I mean, it just gets to the point where it's like, there's only so many days I can live off hot pockets and peanut butter, you know? <laughs> yeah. And then like, even looking at my, you know, proper musician friends now who I knew, you know, back in the day, so to speak, you know, they're just as miserable and broke as they were when they were 20. And now they have a house or kids or whatever. And, and then, you know, pandemic happens. So like a lot of them, their booking agencies folded, their touring stuff is gone. And, you know, the money they were making is not there. So it's funny to think that, like, at some point I was envious of some of them, you know, because it's like that, sure. that's all music becomes yeah, cool. is just this stupid two bit competition. So, you know, they would get this big festival and, you know, we band I was in would be opening rather than headlining. And, and you know, I'd be really envious of that. But looking back on it, it's like, God, I'm so thankful I didn't get just sucked into that. And, mm -hmm. you know, and just that constant like egoism is not my thing. <laughs> well, I think one of the big things, and this is the big question that you pose in your series, that if people don't watch it the whole way through, they won't get your answer if they don't make it to the end of the yeah. videos. And that's been my running joke with like Ben and some of the other YouTubers I chat with is I, I feel like people think I'm just the Eeyore sad boy mustache of music YouTube because I don't put subway surfers across the bottom of my videos because it's <laughs> like, God, God forbid it takes me 20 minutes to distill you information and then you are required to think about it on your own. That's sometimes just too much to ask with like the general audiences, which is really funny. But at the same time, I get it, you know, and I think that's that's most of YouTube is just knee jerk surface level reactions. But at the same time, that is what incites, you know, the necessity of yellow journalism that it takes to run a YouTube channel. Like, sure, my video is titled Why Make Music When No One Cares. But if I titled it, you can do it. Just believe in yourself. Who's going to click on that? I mean, that's that is basic human psychology. Negativity bias works. And it's there Absolutely. for a reason, you know, and it's like, that's, and, it's the Mr. Beast philosophy of you're not going to get a million views without getting in front of a million people. Yeah. That's the game. And it's the same thing with music. You know, if you want to be a big music star, if you're going to make obscure, ambient, minimal noise music, you can't come complaining to me when Spotify doesn't put you on new release Friday, you know, mm -hmm. maybe go make some lo-fi or some like pop rock or something. And you might have a better shot. That's just the nature of the creative game. And this is why it was my instinct to defend you against any naysayers from moment one by saying, I don't think you understand how well Cameron is able to play the game of figuring out 
how this stuff works so he can get a message and art that he cares about. Because I consider your videos art. You found Good. a way That's to get That's kind of the art. point anymore. <laughs> <laughs> Good, yes. So you found out a way to get the art that you care about and that you enjoy making and that you enjoy solving this puzzle of how am I going to tell this story? How am I going to think of a new idea that's going to change people's day for the better? And how am I going right. to get in front of them? You figured out how to play that game within the confines given by YouTube. But then if I go to your Instagram channel, it's very different. There's no yeah. viewing on Instagram because it's a totally different channel. And you understand that as well. So if we go to your Instagram, it's like, this new synth is great. It's cool. And it's like, right. that's what you want for Instagram. And with YouTube, it does have that, like you said, that kind of negative emotional bias thing is. Yeah. Um, and it's, it's hard because I think, you know, even Mr. Beast has said that of just like, it, it's easier to make like negative clickbait than it is to make an outright positive video. Yeah. And, you know, I think that's the hard part of like the compromise of these things because people look at it and say, oh, it's so depressing and whatever. But it's like, these are all the conversations we have with each other, whether you want to admit it or not. I'm just going to go ahead and talk about it because I think, you know, and having done YouTube for so long now, it's like I did the initial thing of just like, hey, I'm a person and here are some things I want to talk about. And that's like kind of my thing. And, you know, eventually it got to the point where I was able to do like the whole gear tube thing, but it's just this hollow shilling garbage and having played a lot of sides of that fence because, you know, having a channel that grew pretty quick, I ended up working with a lot of brands as well to like help them understand influencer marketing and like how to do it, how to approach, you know, what kind of budgets it takes and like how to determine an influencer's value, so to speak. And you know, having seen that side of it, having been, you know, approached by all the, you know, Nord VPN and whatever and all that stuff, it, it just became this like stupid game that I'm not interested in playing. And I could and I, you know, I could keep doing gear videos and sound design videos and whatever, but there's nothing to me that's interesting or special about that. And there's nothing I can do about that that's not entirely replaceable. Mm. And yeah. I think that's kind of where it came to this thing of like, I'm bored of this and I want to make, you know, my, my ethos with my channel has always been, I want to make the videos I wish I had. And it just kind of coalesced into this, like, I'm very interested in music, you know, having had a career in music for a long time. I'm very interested in cinematography. I'm very interested in writing and I'm very interested in psychology and philosophy. So why not just overlap these things and turn it into something else that I think ultimately ends up being more, unique and more meaningful both to myself and to the viewer and i still get those comments you know one or two a week of like, oh i miss you know i miss when you would teach me how to make kick drums and like <laughs> you know that that's a video that like ten thousand people care about at most and that's fine but i'm just not interested in talking about that anymore because i did that for you know four straight years and that's what I do all day anyway, you know? So it's like, that's the last thing I want to spend, you know, 10 days making a video about to get up to like the production standard I want and the vision I have for my channel, because it kind of just became this like sort of why can't music YouTube look like Netflix, but also mm -hmm. why am I even in music too? Because that's, I don't want to be there. And that's probably my biggest regret with YouTube is like, if I could do it all over, I would have gone very differently. But at this point, it's like, I want to just talk about like, creative YouTube. You know, what is it like to be an artist in any field, you know, whether you're, a, you know, visual artist, a chef, a musician, whatever. And what you know, what is the nature of art? What is the role of art? And what is the purpose of, you know, that that drive? we have to create things. That's the stuff I'm interested in exploring. And I think the upside being it comes out to be more universal, but at you know, the same time, it's a bit of a struggle because there is this constant just like game you have to play with YouTube pigeonholing you into like certain things. So, you know, I've got some videos I've put out that have been more experimental. I've got some videos I've got planned that are more experimental. I mean, even my last video was an experiment of if I focus on music, does it work? And it doesn't, you know, and it, it's frustrating because I love music, but at the same time, there's just such a ceiling to that. But at the same time, it's freeing to know that in that if that's where the wall is, then I don't have to stay there, you know, and I, I think that's the beauty of creative work.
is if after a certain point, you know, you are the one that defines the bar. Right. Well, I've got to say uh, with how thoughtful you are about, you know, how you have to a create art that you want to create and that inspires you and B make that fit to what the algorithm gods will let you do. Right. I believe that this kind of approach that you take and that you've, you've managed this so well makes me have no second thoughts that if you wanted to be primarily an artist, you could do that because yeah. there's a different set of games you have to play. Now, me personally, I, if, if someone asked me, how do you succeed on YouTube? I have a channel with 128,000 subscribers, but I put out a video these days and you know, our average views on these days on new videos is 2,000 to 10,000 um, on just the video versions Then we have more uh, listeners. And this is because I do YouTube completely wrong, right? I've never thought about any of the stuff. I've put like no effort into the shot. And my biggest thing is like, <laughs> if I want to succeed at YouTube, I would do exactly what Cameron does. He's awesome. And I'm sure that you can look at artists where you're like, man, if I wanted to go the artist route, this, this is the kind of stuff I want to do that I don't right. want to have to do. So I wanted you to give the pitch because you talked about a few things that you think don't work for artists in some recent videos. The things that they could try that you think are just going to be a waste of time, a waste of money and make the experience even more depressing. What are those things that you see in successful artists where you're like, if I wanted to go the artist route as a musician, that's what I would do. What are those few things that you could recommend that would be the the things to prioritize for those who want listens rather than to be YouTube personalities? Yeah, I think, you know, the biggest thing is just this sense of self-confidence and like mm. a, a pure unadulterated confidence in your decision-making abilities because, you know, without calling out other YouTubers and stuff, just so much of this industry is designed around like, you know, like, I, I mean, I guess to use like a, a tangential example here, the morning routine, right? We look at what we're doing. We can see that there's a problem in the case of a musician. It's I'm not getting enough Spotify followers, you know, or like my, my mixes suck, right? You know, it's just, there, there is a problem. So we idolize this idea that there's a solution out there that exists. And it's something that we don't know and haven't been told. And it's something that can be given to us. But I think like the most powerful thing in the truest sense of being an artist is just doing your own thing. Um, I've had a video planned about this forever, but like the long and short of it being like, all right, Green Day with Dookie, right? If I'm sure you remember that album, I mean, people in the chat, sure, I, I'm, I'm, I'm old, yes. maybe dating myself a little bit here, but like, you know, Dookie came out and people were pissed because like the production was kind of meh. And it was like this poppy version of punk, you know, and it was like, this is mainstream, but the, or, or is Saint Anger. Another great example, probably dating myself again here, Saint Anger, everyone ripped the snare drum tone apart on that, right? Like it was a meme for a while there, but they did it anyway. And it worked, you know, and you look at like run the jewels, run the jewels, make some of the best hip hop I've heard in recent years. And I think it's because they're not following these trends and ideas. They're just sticking to their artistic vision. You know, look at an artist like Bjork is always like my go-to example of like, I, I'm a, I'm not a fan of Bjork's music. I'm a fan of Bjork, if that's the way to put it, of just like someone who does not care at all and is just <laughs> doing their thing. I think that is like YouTube music or otherwise, that is the single most effective key to like embracing the idea of becoming an artist in any capacity. Like you do not I'm have totally to make excuses you. for yourself. I'm totally with you on two things there. One, Bjork is one of my favorite artists of all time, period. Um, I have a friend who's like, I can't stand listening to Bjork. She's always late when she's singing. It's like, no, no, the music is early. You're wrong. She's just uh, <laughs> fantastic. First quick question before I get into my point is a favorite Bjork era, uh, album or era? Ah, uh, man. That's really hard. <laughs> all I'm going like... to give you mine. I'm going to go for the easiest entry into Bjork. I, I have all of her records, but the easiest entry into Bjork is probably post. And I think sometimes it's, it's one of those situations where something's popular for a reason, where if a listener to this isn't into Bjork yet, I think it is the place to start. Um, that said, once you're a super fan, maybe you go into other things. But if you were to try to guide someone who's not familiar with her into hearing a record, um, would you start them with post or something else? 
Actually, yeah, I think so. I think that kind of makes sense because like some of the other Bjork stuff just gets pretty out there. Yeah. I think. What I was mean, the one know. where she did like the, uh, like the, she does the one from the perspective of singing as uh, the, the character is the ocean that she's singing. Is that Vespertine? Your tears are salty. I'm why. Yes. Uh, I want to say. Gorgeous yeah. one. It's the one where she has uh, most great. of the arrangements are done with vocals. I want to say it's Vespertine. I, I could be. And, and that's anyway. the cool thing with like what Bjork does is like just so experimental with it, but it yeah. works because it's like that is just, you know, again, it's about setting your own bar and it's not about looking to someone else to like solve your problem of like, if I just follow this morning routine, I'm going to be productive as hell. Yes. You know, if I mix this way, my record's going to sound great. It's just if you deliver the product and say, this is what you get, that's it. Yeah. You know, and that's why like no fi punk exists in a, in a world where production actually matters. No fi punk would never have worked, but it right. did. And I'm it's because they were just you. like, whatever, here's the music, deal with it. <laughs> well, this is one of the, the big points that I wanted to make here is that a lot of engineering people and music producer people will get annoyed at artists who have just started making music and I'm dating myself by calling it Fruity Loops, FL Studio. Right. <laughs> and they're pinning everything. Like everything is all the way in the red and uh, everything's distorting. They're doing everything wrong. They're putting reverbs on individual tracks instead of using buses, man. And like sometimes those people make really awesome sounding beats, records, whatever, that blow out of the water people who've been putting a decade into this because they're just totally unafraid. They don't know that they're doing things wrong. They're just chasing what sounds like hype to them. And right. they come out with these things that sound awesome. And then someone else looks in their session and goes, oh, pff, you're doing it all wrong. We need to, uh, you know, make you do things the proper way. And then people will go down this path for a little while and they start to learn engineering and music production and they actually get worse for a little while. You know, yeah. they understand more about the process, but they do so much more second guessing of themselves. Well, and it's, and, it's a thing of the process and not the art. It's the technicality rather than the aesthetic. Yeah. Which and like, I, I, I remember you'd that. be chasing outcome rather than process, I'd imagine. Yeah, I, when I, before I dropped out of production college, because that was a waste of time, uh, I had a teacher, uh, <laughs> Mr. Hellman's, and uh, we were, I don't remember what we were doing. The, the assignment was like miking up a, a drum kit or something along those lines. I don't remember. And, you know, it was like the basic sort of thing, you know, mic on the snare, got the, you know, Tom mics hooked up, got the, you know, XY overhead set up and blah, 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 blah. And then you know, the, what is it? The Yamaha sub kick and like all the, all the classic stuff of like recording a drum kit. And, um, this kid in my group, there was, I don't know what kind of snare drum this was, but it was a snare drum where the bottom head had like a port in it. I don't know what that is. I don't know that I've ever Never really seen one. Snare drum, wow. Yeah. I don't know. It was something really weird. Um, but yeah, I had a snare drum, little porthole in the bottom and a bunch of snares and this kid shoved a mic up in there. And this other kid in my group, um, you know, walked up and he's like, Hey, you can't, you know, you're not supposed to do that. Blah, 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 blah. And I'll never forget it. Cause my production teacher looked over to him and said, why? <laughs> and just like dead silence. And it was like, I think that's the attitude that matters in art. And, you know, I think that that's kind of the sort of thing I try to embrace a lot of the times is like, you know, with my YouTube videos and stuff, I don't want to do the same things and I want to push myself into my own territory. And I think that's, again, just what works as an artist where like, if you just don't give a shit, you define the output yeah. and there, there's no one that can tell you you're doing it wrong. And I think like that whole carnage uh, episode with razor music years ago, if you remember that, yeah, um, uh, carnage, big name, uh, DJ producer guy, I think he goes by another name now, but he did this thing with Razor Music Laptop Company where it was like a tutorial and he showed kind of all this garbage tips of like, here's how I make my 808s. And it was just really, really funny because it was the same thing, just redlining and like doing all this really stupid stuff. And like he, he didn't know what the volume knob did and things like that. But Seamless R, uh, one of my, you know, YouTube heroes back in the good old days, Seamless R came out with this video and he just railed against everyone going against him because he was like, whether or not it is technically correct, what Carnage is showing is how he does his process. So therefore it is right. Like this is his way of doing things. And I think that's, especially with the YouTube era of music production culture, and this is why I hate music YouTube so much anymore, is there's just this obsessive nature 
with specific processes and techniques and correct or incorrect. And, and I think a lot of it is just like a, a music tube form of identity politics where, you know, I watch Mr. Bill. Therefore, if you're not using 87 bands of compression on your snare, you're an idiot. Or, you know, hey, I watch Sadowick and it doesn't matter that you're not using glue compression on your master bus. Or, hey, I watch, you know, Pensado's place. And technically speaking, if you're not low passing your reverb at, you know, 6K, you're messing up the phase and the high and just like all this dumb shit that does not matter. Because that's like one of the messages I've tried to convey so many times on my channel is like, there has never been an instance of time where I have listened to a record with my wife or any of my friends, even my music friends, where someone has like stopped the song and been like, you know, the fact that they used a Neumann on the vocals there, stupid decision. I would have used a 58. You know, like no, nobody thinks like that. We just have this like innate tribalism in our beliefs. And I think that has only been enhanced by like, I don't know, the music tube culture, which is just interesting. I, I definitely know and have noticed what you're talking about. And I think it's one of the reasons I appreciate uh, your outlook on this stuff and uh, your channel is I come from a somewhat similar background. The way I got into this stuff, I had been doing music production and audio for maybe a decade, pretty much professionally. And at a certain point, I was like, I was feeling this lack of confidence. And this lack of confidence was before the era of music YouTube. It was in the era of the forums. I'm probably right. roughly a decade older than you. And that's what that's what the, the music ecosystem was. And it was just a whole bunch of people who were becoming hypochondriacs about their sound and about their equipment and about their approach. And oh yeah, that was like all of dogs on acid. When I was like really getting serious about learning more technical stuff about production and sound design, just going on dogs on acid was just this like poop flinging competition. <laughs> no, dude, your respaces suck. It has too much 500 Hertz. And it's like no one on the planet cares. Right. And this was the, um, the focus back in the day where it was, um, gear sluts. It was then called it was probably oh, one yeah. of the dominant yeah. forms of communication in the music production world. And I was looking at the music production world, you know, in 2008 and 2009 and thinking like, the music production world is kind of in shambles. Like, how has this been working out for us as the main form of discourse? Are we actually focusing on what matters and what gets people results, you know? Right. And are we focused? And people were so focused at that point on, on gear. And I was like, no, man, it's, it's, it's not about gear. It's about people and aesthetic choices and listening to records and figuring out right you know, how do I get from point A to point B? And there's probably several different ways to do it. But even more importantly, what should point B be? Like figuring that part of it out. And that's kind of what inspired me to start writing in the studio world. And I started by interviewing a ton of people. So my beginning was interviewing a ton of, you know, some of the, it started with the music producers and engineers whose stuff I loved the most. Like, here's a blonde redhead record I love. Here's a Sonic Youth record I love. Here's a, you know, Run DMC record I love. Like, how did you do it? Why did you do it that way? And what I came away with is that there's so many different approaches and so many of those differences are somewhat meaningless. Like, they are personal preferences of the way in which people work. And they're not the main things that affect the actual outcome. And it was kind of my goal to figure out what are some of those main things that these people actually do? Like, what do they all have in common? Like, we get away from all the stuff that you're denigrating right now, rightfully so. Like, what's left? What are, like, right. the big principles? And I think that's been my mission is to kind of uncover those things. And um, that's, that's where I try to do, I think, in the longer form stuff I do. And if I was smarter, the problem with me, Cameron, is I'm trying to figure it all out as I go along out loud, you know? And uh, so I'll have an, uh, an hour long think... episode where I'm thinking along <laughs> with people, right? And I'm trying to make the stuff materialize. Um, and to a degree, like I have formalized it. I formalized it in courses. And I think that's probably where people get the most edited, condensed version of it. But a big part of it is not just technique, but emotion. So I think yeah. one of the biggest things we can do for people, I think in music production, YouTube is in giving them all of these tricks and ideas is say to them, like, here's all these tricks. Here's all these concepts. Here's all these technically correct ways of doing it. Here's technically how phase really works. And we can talk about all that stuff, 
so that they stop asking so many questions about it so they can go back to focusing on what's important. Right. And, and I, I think it just doesn't hopefully work. Hopefully every time I go I, for a technical deep dive, it's like, let's talk about this for an hour so we never have to talk about dither again. Right. Like it doesn't, it's not going to make or break what's going on. But I know that until you've gone that deep down, you're not going to put aside that your dither isn't going to make or break your record until you've talked about it. So how do you uh, imagine that balance? Because I'm sure with you do beautiful videography as well to take uh, an example from kind of a parallel art form. There's probably things about cameras that you know that you don't need to know to get the shots oh, yeah. that you do. But I yeah. imagine that if you didn't put in the time to know those things, you'd be constantly asking yourself and second guessing yourself. So where do you see that balance of we're always going to ask until we find out. So how do you, how do you yeah, balance think, knowledge acquisition and understanding of minutia with focusing on what's important? I, I think it's in that balance of like knowing the parameters and, you know, artistic liberty. It, it's really hard to find that because it, it's one of those things where you don't know what questions you have until someone, you know, answers something else. I feel like a lot of the times where, you know, I've watched, and most of my time on YouTube, like I don't watch music YouTube stuff. A lot of my time on YouTube is spent watching like philosophy videos or film critiquing videos or, you know, audio stuff sometimes like very, very small, but, you know, a lot of stuff about cinematography, color grading and film theory, writing, you know, things like that. Um, and I think it's one of those things where sometimes you hear a piece of information and it leads you to new questions so I think the balance is just knowing how to remain curious enough to stay interested. But like, if you just obsess over the information, you get nothing done. Mm -hmm. If that makes sense, you know, it's like, it's easy to sit here and just rail on like the rules of like classical production, you know, techniques and like, what are the different panning laws and why do they matter and things like that. But yeah, I think it's, the balance just comes from like, yeah, having that ability to remain curious enough to stay engaged with the topic without like thinking, you know, everything, because then, you know, we've had a pretty bad like Dunning Kruger effect there. <laughs> but yeah. yeah, it's it's hard to know when you know enough because you never really will. So I think that's that's the balance is just a shift in the mindset of not necessarily needing to understand, but needing to want to understand. Mm. As you're that talking hard about to phrase. it, <laughs> yeah, no, that works. But as you're talking about it, I think what's coming to mind for me is that as long as you have the the right, you know, north star, the right true north, and and the the way to avoid that is to never find yourself saying, "Well, I can't do my best until." And I think that's right. the biggest problem. Now that I'm trying to look for an underlying principle, the biggest problem with when Gear Sluts dominated was. I can't make the great sounding records until I have X, Y, Z preamp. Yeah. And, right? and I mean, that's pretty much what all music marketing is built on. And I think that's a large part of what music YouTube eventually became is it's just this constant rotating carousel of crap that, you know, <laughs> none of what you need, like I don't need 90% of the stuff out there. And that's one of the things where it's like, you know, it's exciting when you see the new video from so-and-so about the new you know, preamp or synth or whatever. And like, you know, I'm a giant gear nerd. I love this sure. stuff, <laughs> like obviously, but you know, I just look at it and go like, cool. You know, I'm, I'm, I don't need a new microphone right now. I don't need a new preamp. I don't need another, you know, giant stupid poly synth or whatever. What I need to do if I want to make music is to get off YouTube and just make some music. <laughs> yep. Like, and I think and, that's and the I think annoying that's the big part thing of it. Is that to remember that all of these trappings are for, our enjoyment and so that we can yeah. reinvest in our business and we stay curious about the kinds of things that we do. Um, but to keep them from being totems, you know, and to keep them from yeah. being obstacles and the same thing, not yeah. only goes for gear, but also for knowledge as important as I think. Yeah. Well, I mean, is, you know, you can sell informational watch, courses, right? Yeah. Like you could sit there and watch music theory videos all day, but like you can't apply any of it until you write a song, <laughs> you know? And I think that's, that's the hard part. And it's always a frustrating thing to have to think about because I, I find myself in that mindset all the time where I get sucked into like, you know, like I, I, I've been looking at some new cameras recently. Right. And I fall into that where it's like, you fall into this idea of like, I'm in love with the idea of the thing rather than doing the work. Yeah. And I think that's a lot of just consumerist product YouTube, you know, whether it's like film production stuff or audio production stuff, you know, gear or tutorials or whatever. 
it's this constant thing where like a lot of people don't want to sit there and admit to themselves that like they're just more of a collector than they are a doer. And I don't really think there's anything wrong with that, but I think there's sort of a predatory mindset in like the design of product content YouTube, <laughs> where it's just designed to keep you doing, you know, getting excited about the next thing rather than using the shit you already have. Yeah. So, it, and it's hard because like I sit there all the time and look at cameras and lenses and go like, oh man, the amount of like sick shots I'm going to get with that lighting rig or like, man, if I had that gimbal, shit. <laughs> and and it, it falls into that thing where it's like, I'm just, I'm acting like a hobbyist rather than someone who does this. Yeah. Well, here's a great parallel to audio and video. We all know it's, you know, the engineer more than it's the gear, but we'll use the analogy of video for those of us who are less emotionally attached to it, like myself. Um, if you got a better camera, Cameron, your video quality might improve by 10%. Right. But if you and I switched cameras right now, our shots would probably look about the same in that <laughs> you, you could take my Canon T6i that I'm talking into right now, and um, I could give it to you. You could give me, I think you have a Sony a7. It's a nicer camera, yeah. a mirrorless. And we could switch. And my camera shot would maybe improve by 3%, um, assuming I do nothing else. And your shot would look just about as good as it does now. And I think Probably. there's <laughs> such a, there's such a, and here's another good analogy for uh, video. I think I want to throw at you, see if this one sticks. Acoustic treatment, I think, is one of the underrated pieces of gear that people could sh could or should allocate more resources to oh, yeah. rather than things like preamps and yet another plugin that does the same thing. My feeling is that acoustic treatment, possibly one of the most important things that you can have in your space. It makes everything you record in your space sound better and it helps you make better choices. I think the corollary to that in the video world, tell me if I'm wrong, is lighting. Do you think lighting is the acoustic treatment of video? I think so. Yeah. Lighting is like everything for a good shot, like lighting and lenses, I think are kind of the two big things, which like, you know, that's kind of like your, your monitors and your acoustic treatment. It's the two things that pair together the most. Cause it's like with crappy lenses, you know, it, it can be fine. But like, if you invest in quality glass and like understand how to do like a nice lighting setup, it, it, that'll go exponentially further than buying like a better camera body. There's a video by uh, Nigel Barros called uh, something to the effect of how to make a $300 camera look pro. Um, and it's a great video because yes, it's the perfect example one. of it's a perfect example of like everything we're talking about here, where it's just it's the way you use it, not the gear itself. And I think that's, you know, like when I get asked that stuff about, you know, mixing or like writing music or making, you know, textures and sound design like how did you get so good at it and it's like i you know i've watched all the same shit you know mr bill seamless sadowick you know <laughs> watched thousand videos on like blade runner and you know all the other stuff but you know the thing is just i did it a bunch of times and did it very very badly and then it just became hard to do it badly and then eventually it's like i don't you know there's a point where it's like you, you still watch the tutorials and stuff now and again but like most of it is just learning to identify what you want to change to get it more in line with what you're hearing in your head. Like it's important to have that ground foundation of like in the camera world, understanding ISO and aperture and shutter speed and, you know, how to set an exposure and things like that. But you're not going to have the style of like a Tarantino film by watching tutorials. And even if you do the more you work at getting in the style of Tarantino or someone, for example, the more you're going to be frustrated with it because Tarantino is always going to be one step ahead at being Tarantino than you are. You know, I look at like Butch Vig and, you know, Pensato and all these other engineers and stuff. I look at, you know, musicians. I love Ben Frost and, you know, Bjork and so on. And I, oh man, I wish I could do that. But at the same time, it's just remembering that like, I, I wish I could do that in my own way. Like I am not concerned with being the best mix engineer or the best whatever. I'm concerned with being the best version of what I want to do. Yeah. You know, and I think that was like my YouTube mistake for a long time was just trying to be the best version of like, you know, loop op or whatever I was watching at the time. Like I want to do that, but better. And I want to do this, but better. But, you know, it drove me insane. 
because the numbers always get bigger. There is no winning. And that person is always one step ahead of where you're going to be. So, you know, and I think it was maybe Kim Tyle from Soundgarden who said something similar of like, I don't want to be like the best guitar player in the world. I want to be the best at what I do. And I think that's a that's a huge part of like a healthy artistic philosophy. <laughs> yeah. Well, I think there's a, a trick to that balance once again, where there's two opposing forces here, both of which are potentially positive. And one of these forces is you don't want to imitate others. You want to be the best version of yourself. But there's this other opposing force of you need a reference for what good is like and what has come before you that you can point to and saying, they're doing things right that I like. If only I could do some of that, but I don't want right. to copy them exactly. And I think that's kind so of the I nature like of influence myself. is like the nature of influence is identifying like points that you enjoy and then understanding what you don't, mm -hmm. you know, if like, if I listen to, I don't know if I listen to like Hans Zimmer scores or something, you know, Hans Zimmer, brilliant musician by all accounts, obviously, you know, he's, you may have heard of him, mm -hmm. <laughs> but like, you know, there are certain things about Hans Zimmer's scores where I just kind of like roll my eyes when I hear like these things he does or whatever. But, you know, there's a lot about his music I appreciate. And same with like the production realm. You know, I listen to something like, you know, the virtual riot or whatever, you know, I listen to a, a nine inch nails album and I, I hear the production on that. I'm like, Oh, I really like this. But then there's like certain things about the production that annoy me. And I really don't like, or the things about the songwriting I enjoy, but some things I don't like about, you know, the melodic phrasing or whatever. And I think that's, that's the way that forming that frame of reference really works. It's not about necessarily learning like any and every aspect to imitating something. It's just about learning to develop like a sense of critical thinking ability when it comes to like the nature of your art. I, I totally get what you're saying and you're totally right. The one, I, this isn't necessarily pushback, but I want to think about thinking back to when you were first acquiring the skills. Cause there's almost, I feel like two different pieces of advice. One for the person who is somewhat mature as an artist and one for the person who does not yet have skills. And do you think that copying and badly failing in the direction of yourself is possibly a step stone where to develop the skills at first, you might have to emulate. And I'm trying to give advice to my younger yeah. self because my younger self had such a, an urge to be unique that I almost couldn't get anything started because it wasn't unique enough. And when I started to focus less on being a musician like I was when I was a teenager, and I started to focus as an engineer, I'm like, I'm going to take a different approach. First, I, I want to get to the point where I could mimic if I wanted to, and then choose not to. This idea yeah. of learning how to write out of a copy book by literally writing down sentences, getting a feel for the structure of how they work. Because this is literally how kids learn to write in like the 19th century, 18th century. They'd have something called a copy book. You'd read poems, you'd read short stories, and you'd literally transcribe them so you could work on handwriting and grammar and sentence structure. And yeah. then like you could imitate but then you could also create. And it's one of the pieces of advice I often give people who are struggling to get to the next level in their music production is that I can tell that there's a lot of stuff that's working well, but it doesn't sound like they've critically listened in their space to enough records in their general style. And yeah, they're making choices sure. that don't make sense for their style. And it's like, man, I felt like Yes, you can have a, a snare that's too loud or too quiet for your genre if it feels intentional, but you can't necessarily if it feels unintentional. So that's a big thing is like, is this going out of the zone of what's come before you in your style? Does it feel like it comes from a place of confidence and like, F them, we're going to go bigger with this or we're not right. going to, or we're going to leave out the bass on this song. So that's my question. At least when you're acquiring the skills and getting to where you are, which I would say you're mature as an artist. To get to maturity as an artist, was copying at some point necessary? Like copying shots, can I get that kind of shot too? And yeah, and I, and I think that's kind of a big thing is like, you know, pushing more into cinematography and whatever. Yeah, there's a lot of like learning to frame things a different way and learning to think of lighting in a different way. And I think with music and all that or anything, I think the biggest piece of advice I could give to myself, you know, 12 years ago or whatever, when I was like really getting serious with stuff is just learn how to fail the right way where, you know, you're going to copy things or whatever. And like, you know, early on it was like, 
I guess around that time, you know, Nickelback was like the big band and whatever. I guess Nickelback's still pretty big, <laughs> but like, yep. you know, when it came to rock music production, that is how a rock record should sound. Whether you like Nickelback or not, I think objectively that is the almost penultimate sound of like rock music production. You know, it is it is obsessively clean. It hits hard as hell. You know, the vocal tracks are incredible. The guitar tone's amazing. The drums just like beat your skull in and all that. Um, so I think, you know, learning to try and imitate is good, but it's learning how to understand and develop from failure that's a lot more helpful. Because if you just try and fail, you know, the, you know, it's the old get up and try again, you know, and you do it again and you fail again and you learn something. But I think it's developing, yeah, that kind of same critical thinking ability of, okay, it doesn't sound like whatever, you know, artist I'm trying to aim to be or whatever. So what went wrong? And like, you know, and don't be afraid to like admit that to yourself, because I think that's something that and I get in my own head about this all the time. I'm working on a score for a video game right now. And like, God, just the amount of times I've listened back to stuff and just been like, this sucks or whatever. Or, you know, I open up the doll and I'm just staring at it like, I don't know what to do. You know, I, I have no clue what to write right now. And it's a matter of just getting out of your head and leaning into it, just letting things happen and then addressing kind of just like a poor, like postmortem thing. You know, it didn't sound like I wanted it to. What went wrong and what could I change to get better next time? And you might not necessarily have an answer, but you can find a direction that's going to be helpful. Like, you know, let's say you're doing the Nickelback thing and you're like, God, you know, vocal track sounds nice, but like the drums just don't hit. So it's not an answer, but like we've found something that we need to work on. So now we know where we need to look. And I think we can be more productive rather than more aimless of just like, it doesn't sound right. You know, it doesn't sound right because dot, 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 you know, the bass isn't loud enough. The vocals aren't heavy. You know, the, the mix doesn't pump hard enough. You know, you might suddenly discover bus compression. You might suddenly discover parallel compression. You might discover spectral side chaining, you know? Yeah. So, yeah, I think that's a, that's a huge thing of like just adopting a growth oriented mindset of like, don't be afraid to fail, but make sure you fail the right way. Yeah. It, it is so tricky because they say, you know, the comparison is the thief of joy, right? You know, and if you compare yourself too much to others, you're always going to fail at being them, right? You can only succeed at being the best version of yourself. All of that is true. But again, we have to balance it with this idea of if you want modern rock sounding productions, you have to figure out how, why the Foo Fighters sound the, the way that they do right. and why your records sound absolutely nothing like them. And you might at a certain point, depends on the band, you might start recognizing, well, I, for some reason, have this allergic reaction to the idea of doing any sample augmentation and the particular style of metal that I'm looking at, all the drums are samples and right. I'm not willing to do that. <laughs> it's like, well, okay, this is something you want to imitate their drum sounds. You want to be in that world. Here's what you're going to have to do. Otherwise, you're going to be purposefully creating some other type of art and hoping that you're the kind of person who creates a new genre. And you know what? We're doing metal in the year 2022, but there's no sample drums and there's no click tracks. And it sounds like Venom from like the 1970s. Yeah. And it's like a mid rangey <laughs> met record mix. And we're doing that like on purpose. But now we're listening to Venom records from the 1970s and going like, hmm, this is our North Star. How come our records don't sound like that? Oh, we're scooping yeah. out too much mid range, you know? So there is, I think, that necess necessity to really be a lover of the style that you're in. And and you, one of the reasons you have a great shot is clearly you're a lover of good looking cinematography. And this is one of the reasons that I have a terrible shot is that when I watch YouTube videos, I look at someone who has a great shot like you and I'm like, that's gorgeous. I'm never going to be able to do that. I'm right. going to put my phone <laughs> down and listen to it with earbuds while I wash the dishes because that's how I consume. Like I listen to people. So that's, that's what exactly I do. why my channel is the way it is. Yes. It's, it's a podcast. And I would, like, if, if I compared myself to uh, Cameron, I would want to hang myself because I'm like, I'm never going to have the patience to fiddle around with lights and uh, framing and composition and the beautiful depth of field you have even in this little interview shot. You know, all that stuff uh, is is gorgeous, but it's like, for me, I have this other side that, that I want to lean into. If I compared myself there, I would want to die. But that said, if there's a period where 
I want to increase production values for my own videos on the Sonic Scoop channel, I would have to sit down, watch videos like yours and others in the space and say, how do I get a little bit closer in my own way? How do I try to imitate what's happening? Right. Figure out what's the difference between the depth of field he has and the lighting that he has. Why is it softer than my lighting? And I'd really have to spend that time of seeing, could I do a Cameron-like shot? Okay, great. I'm going to fail at a Cameron-like shot, well, that's but the hard thing now I can trade and like, change into a Justin-like shot. If you want to do all that, then it's like, you know, can't you get a video out every week? Right. I can't. Yes. <laughs> me? You know, my no. videos used my to schedule take, and other like, obligations, absolutely zero chance. Right. And that's been the hard part for me is balancing all that because like, you know, between all the music work I do and like sound design work and stuff and then, you know, running my own channel and then, you know, working on videos for other clients and whatever, like it's insane. And like my videos, when I started, you know, I started like everyone else. It's like, hello, here is me in a webcam. I am going to talk words <laughs> at you for 30 minutes. I'm going to edit that a little bit. And it is going to go up on YouTube with a thumbnail and title that I decide right then and there. <laughs> you used to Whereas, be able like, to do you know, that, by the way. That's how yeah. I started in 2015 when I could sneeze into a camera oh, the, and get 50,000 views. And then people came the along who were actually panels, good at this. Yeah, like it, it has changed so much. Because, you know, when I started, like that was my influence was like I was watching Seamless and Sadowick and Mr. Bill and Frequent and, you know, everybody else in that space at that time. And, you know, like the Cymatics tutorials and whatever. Ghost Hack had a bunch. And it was, yeah, like person with a webcam yammering on about wavetables for 45 minutes and it worked. But now it's, I mean, like, God, YouTube is one of those things where I, I just can't believe it's free. Like some of the content I have watched on YouTube is unreal. You know, like some of the nature documentaries you can find and stuff like that, or even channels like Pensado's Place. I can't believe that's free. You know, like, I mean, damn, that is like the top tier of production content. Mm -hmm. And it's like, for, and but then it's funny because then, you know, being a YouTuber, I see people complain like, why do you have ads in your videos? And it's like, <laughs> right. well, I work for them, you know, like work on them for 10 days and then I put them out for you to watch for free. Would you do that for free? You know, like are, it's, yeah, it's like, you know, are, are you going to put your next record out for free? Because I shouldn't have to pay for it. And you know, and I, I know exactly what you mean. Just so the people understand, I'm going to be totally transparent. I think your numbers are probably similar to mine. The respect that if you were to get a million views on YouTube and all of them were monetized, um, you would make something like five thousand dollars. So five to ten, yeah. I think for yeah, me, it's around. It depends 10. on yeah the RPMs for that particular video and what yeah, subject that's it is. A huge thing too. Yeah, we have videos that are. Uh, it might be more like uh, you know. I think there's probably one video where the, is it RPMs or like more like 7.8 and we have other videos where they're more like 5.2. There's a range. Yeah, it totally but, depends on the, the video itself. Cause I know people who do like home improvement YouTube videos that get, right. you know, 20,000 views, but it's like, they'll make six grand off that video. Like it is unreal. Yes. If you do it in finance, if we're in finance or something like that, it's similar. Those can be more like $10, I believe in, mm -hmm. in that, uh, in that world. But still you're talking about, you know, uh, if it's $10 and a million views, you're talking about $10,000, which starts to be a bit more sustainable. But the advertising revenue thing does make more sense if you're in a different market. So Cameron, if you were into say cooking instead of music and you had a cooking channel with your same levels of production, you'd be, instead of getting a hundred thousand video uh, views on your better videos, you'd be getting a million views on them. Oh, yeah, and then all easily. of a sudden the ad revenue starts to make more sense. But we're in such a niche field that the only way it may works for people is with brand sponsorships, courses right. to sell memberships, which Patreons. I'm not willing to really do anymore. So that really yeah. sucks. <laughs> yes. Burned a I lot of those bridges. <laughs> Speaking of which, great segue. I'll show you how I do mine, uh, Cameron. This is how I'm able to have one-tenth as many views and pay my mortgage uh, as you. Okay, here we go. Um, uh, this video is totally free, this conversation, because it is sponsored. And the most important sponsor is you. How do you sponsor this course? How do you sponsor this video? See how good I am at this, Cameron? How do you sponsor <laughs> this video? Check out one of our great full-length courses like Mixing Breakthroughs, Mastering Demystified, or Compression Breakthroughs. Each one of them is guaranteed to change the way that you work forever, for the better. Uh, or your money back, 30 days, something like that. I think that's generally the pitch. But yeah, the, the deal is I tell people in the middle of these podcast episodes that I have a course, actually three of them. There's going to be four soon. And the reason that I like doing this, Cameron, is I turn off so many people with these videos because it's me just talking for an hour. You have right. certain critiques you always get from your viewers. The oh, critique God, I get yeah. from people I hate me is, <laughs> what's with this channel? Why is this guy just talk? And it's like, it's a podcast. What do you want me to do? Dance? So- right. Uh, if you didn't mind hearing me talk for an hour, 
you might like to go, if you want to hear someone talk about compression and mixing for hours on end and give you like guided exercises that are actually going to help you improve what you do, then I have these courses, Mixing Breakthroughs, which gives people like this whole, I would call it, I don't want to call it quite a system, but it's like a roadmap to mixing. It's if you can give yourself a step-by-step repeatable process, which I imagine to some degree you have when you make your videos, you have some degree of a routine that you have to be in. And I know this about you, that you're a man of routine because all of your videos start with you making a cup of coffee, you know? So I'm like, right. This yeah. is There's a man. always like the intro shot, the timestamp, like it's very systematic. <laughs> exactly. And if you don't have some of that in there, you're never going to be able to finish enough mixes to get good. Cause that's one of the big things that stops people from getting good is that they refuse to finish and they refuse oh, yeah. to fail their way to success. And it's even more challenging today because now we're expected to do that out loud in front of an audience, to fail our way oh, to success okay. while people are watching. And it's funny we- because like one of the interesting criticisms I've gotten, which I've talked about a couple of times, like I think in like some streams or something, but um, I, I noticed this whole thing on the Reddit uh, a couple of weeks ago where someone was just like bitching and moaning about me and my channel on Reddit. And it was really, really funny <laughs> because then they were like, Someone replied in the comments and they were like, yeah, his music is too good for what he's talking about. And he's famous and blah, 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 blah. And it was like, it's interesting to think that when you do fail more openly in front of people and like, I try to make my videos from a place of like a lot of emotional vulnerability just to make content that's honest. But because that's, sort of prefaced by like you see my channel has you know quarter million subs or whatever you're like this guy's a liar he's full of shit he can't be dealing with these things you know he's you know he's doing the thing he's a sellout and that's every channel after a certain point it's so funny to think that like when you start you're just you know one of the the crew and you know and and i've seen this like with a lot of my own friends right you know we all start out we're all in bands we're all doing the band thing right and so-and-so's band gets signed by a label and you're like oh my god dude that's awesome like right on your first record deal and they get their first major tour and then you know they're they're opening for mud vein or something and you're like yeah that guy's kind of a dick now <laughs> right like he can't be honestly still cool with me he's just you know placating me by talking to me and it's funny that like there is some kind of, and I've wanted to do a video on it for a while, but like, I can't find any like actual scientific research into this, but like, what is the fall off slope of like honesty and transparency mm-hmm. where like, I feel like because I'm talking about these things that are, you know, like very hard subjects to talk about sometimes and hard things to think about. And like putting myself back in that mindset of like, yeah, I remember like I went through that really hard a couple years ago or like, you know, I'm going through that right now. That's why I'm making this video. And then people turn around and they're like, this is stupid. <laughs> mm-hmm. And it's funny, just like there, there never is any winning, but at the same time, I think, you know, the, the advice there is just like, yeah, you can't take criticism from someone you wouldn't take advice from. And like 10% mm-hmm. of people are just going to hate you no matter what you do. <laughs> yeah. And isn't it amazing how much we have gotten into a culture, or we we were, especially in the forum days before YouTube, we were in a culture of taking advice from people we'd never take advice from. Like that was my oh, issue yeah. with the gear sluts thing is that, and Reddit is like this too, where there are totally some anonymous, really intelligent threads and comments that I've seen oh, on Reddit, yeah. I saw on gear sluts, a hundred percent. Like, how is that free? You shouldn't be like, you're a, a genuinely a wise person, but before you are skilled enough to be able to figure out which ones are dumb and which ones are like brilliant. Like you're a beginner and you can't necessarily differentiate between those, those two. And it, it's tricky. And I do like that YouTube has de-anonymized to a degree who you're getting yeah. your advice from. But still at the same time, I think that a lot of people are learning from people on YouTube who they like their production values yeah, they, but they have no idea what they're talking they about. They come up in the algorithm, <laughs> but they're not necessary. Either the, it's possible. There are some people, I didn't want to say it, you did. They don't know what they're talking about. That's one option. Yeah. Or two, it's just a bad aesthetic fit. Like you're taking advice yeah. from someone who makes a totally different type of music, but you never hear it because they don't feature their own music so much on their channel. Um, and the direction and they're coming too, from. because like, I think you mentioned that in your live stream about the production, like, ranking production channels or whatever it was called of like where i didn't actually it's funny to see 
Right. Yeah. Where it's like you see <laughs> some of these channels and whatever. And, it, and it's funny because it's like, what do you expect? Like you can't be doing music constantly and running some of these YouTube channels who are putting out like a video a week or sometimes more like that's unreal. And like, I, I certainly, if I was more focused on like doing YouTube, I could not do any of what I do. And like the music side of my job, like I would just be stuck crapping out videos constantly especially just to make ends meet because like the revenue is a joke. Yeah, and you don't even have kids yet, Cameron. Uh, you're, uh, I'd imagine around 30. If you would have kids at some point, it changes it even further. And oh yeah, um, yeah, that had a, an impact on the way that I look at things. And it really does force you to prioritize like w- what are the most essential things to do? And how can I, uh, you look like someone who actually takes care of your body physically as well. I feel yep, like- you're Every day, a, gym time. <laughs> good, yes. So to manage all those things, to have the time that you actually need to be sane in mind and healthy in body by doing some physical activity, to have quality, you have, you're married, you have a wife, she expects to see you at uh, some point during the day. You have actual, you want to be a person who's not just talking about music, but also doing it. And you want to make YouTube videos to an amazing degree. It feels like you've put in this time that is probably unsustainable where you were doing videos and even faster pace than you are now the quality oh god yeah well and that's kind of now i feel you doing them slightly less frequently but your view counts are actually going up because people are hungry for it and each one well yeah and i think it's a lot of the thing too if it allows me to spend more time doing the art itself because that's you know kind of like you said it's just i you know without sniffing my own farts here it's like that's what i want to do is like make art i want to put the type of love and attention i do into my music work into my videos and you know it's like letting all those things overlap of like the things i'm actually interested in and not just talking about the new piece of gear because like i could do that i could make a great video on like sure the next couple synths coming out i could make amazing videos on guitar pedals i just don't care anymore (laughs) and i'm sick of it and there's other people that do it so well that like it, it for me it would just worsen my own imposter syndrome of like why am i talking about this when like you know, Ricky Tinez puts out a video and I'm just like, God, like I, I just watching, you know, someone like his channel, it makes me hate myself when I do a gear video. <laughs> so then it just becomes like, why not just put that same level of passion and detail and effort into my videos? It allows me to make the videos I really want to make. It's videos that seem to resonate more with people. And it like allows me to write music that goes with the videos and do little edity tweaky bits and like work on the jokes more, work on the voiceover more. And you know, really put in the work to just, you know, try and improve something with every video and all that. But also just like, I could put out 10 videos that get 10,000 views, or I could put out one video that gets 100,000 views. And every once in a while, I put out, you know, kind of the experiment one, like the last one, which was more focused on music. And it confirmed my suspicions that music is just not the way forward for what I want to do with my channel. You know, it's just there. And it it made me really, really mad. Because like, I I have such a love for music and stuff, obviously, but like, if I, you know, like I said, if I put out a video on like some music theory concepts at this point with my channel, you know, Andrew Wong and Adam Neely and so, and so notwithstanding, you know, uh, Charles Cornell, another phenomenal piano. He's the one I've been. Yeah. Yeah. David Bennett, um, Nari soul thinks how you say her name. Yeah. There's just incredible channels for music theory. Right. So like. Those folks notwithstanding, within my sort of corner of the thing, I could put out a music theory video and it would probably be like the highest performing music theory video in that space. But that is only worth like 30,000 views. Right. And And to put in the production level, like, you know, just to put in the level of effort it takes to make one of my normal videos to make a music theory video look and function the way I want it to, it's just not worth the effort. And it's also, again, just not something I'm like, all that deeply passionate about. So it's like, what do I really care about? What do I really want to talk about? And what do I, what do I think other people need? And, you know, more importantly, what, what is the thing I needed to hear last week, last month, a year ago, yesterday, this morning, you know, whatever, like, I just want stuff to be more real. And I want it to be more focused on just like the broader nature of creative work. Because I think I'm going to make a so recommendation <laughs> to you personally, Cameron. I'm sorry to talk over you there, but I'm going to make a recommendation to you personally because you just set off a lightning bolt in my brain of what I would do if I was Cameron's coach. And this is going to be super uninteresting to most of our listeners, but I have to say it out loud. <laughs> One of the problems with YouTube is it does have this 
um, this way of kind of pigeonholing the channel. So one of the biggest oh, yeah. challenges with my channel is that our most popular videos are MixCon videos that have, you know, some of them have yeah. million plus views on them. And it's like the best people in the world showing you exactly what they did in the DAW. And then the other videos are like me talking for an hour. And the Venn diagram of overlap of person who's interested in A and person who's interested in B is like somewhat small. So the, the right. same issue you'd have on your channel, if you tried to do a music theory channel, people who are into music theory, YouTube isn't necessarily going to show the video to them. It's going to show people who liked all of your previous videos and a bunch of them aren't into music theory. So right. if you ever want to do the artsy music theory video, you reach out to Adam Neely or whoever, and you say, Hey, right. can I do a guest post on your channel? And that's kind and of what then, I've started doing with like tutorials is I still want to talk about, you know, production stuff and whatever, but now it's like, I just put it on my Patreon thing. Because then it's like, then that gives me that outlet of like, I am deeply passionate about this stuff, but I don't have to put up the risk it would pose to my channel to post like, here's a 30 minute video on how to record fully. Yes. <laughs> you know, like no one cares, <laughs> but you know, and I think that's why that recent, uh, like, uh, what was it called? The playlistification of music. I think why that did so well is just because like, that's something I can get my dad to care about. Yeah. Whereas like the South Park one I did, I'm, you know, I was so, so mad at how poorly that performed, but it's also just like, that's just not a subject for everybody. Like it's probably the most popular video on YouTube about like the, you know, operating theory of South Park's writing structure outside of the original <laughs> quote video it discerns from. But like, again, you know, it was an experiment. Like do, does my audience care about this kind of stuff? And as much as it hurts to see that in like the stupid YouTube studio, that's like 10 out of 10, your video sucks. It's helpful to learn because numbers don't lie. And it's mm -hmm. so easy to get, and you know, with a music career or anything, it's so easy to get sucked into these like conspiratorial mindsets of blaming, you know, this third party thing, the algorithm in that case, or, you know, blaming like Daniel Eck for Spotify being garbage or blaming submit hub for not making it easy to get credits and, you know, pitch to curators or whatever. But yeah, it's just, I don't know. It's one of those things that's, it's interesting, but frustrating, but very, very valuable. So I think that's kind of like been shaping the path for me is looking at what has worked in the past and how do I serve that audience better to make it to where it is sustainable for me to do the things I really want to be doing. You know, like I would love to pitch more into like doing more proper, like short films and documentaries, but you know, yeah, it's again, it's that Venn diagram overlap of like, how far is too far out of my realm? And I think that's the thing with YouTube is ultimately you do not define your niche, the audience does. And in my case, my audience has just shifted so much over time that like, I still suck at being a YouTuber, but I'm getting better at it. <laughs> so, you know, it's a, it's a delicate balance. <laughs> I think in our space, you're one of the best YouTubers there is, Cameron, but I think that well, thank you. <laughs> that browbeating you're doing of yourself is one of the reasons that that is the case. And I think this is one thing you find in a lot of successful people. Well, there are two types of successful people. There are insanely confident people like a Chris Lord Algae, where he's like, yes, I know I'm the best. I am the best. That's just how it is. And that is one type of successful person. But I don't know that the majority of the successful people I've studied, the majority of the successful mixers, producers, artists I've studied have exactly the same outlook you do. They think every Everything they're doing is kind of terrible, but they can make it a bit better than it was. And they're addicted to that process of making it a bit right. better. And the and negative self-talk that they have drives them forward but and makes them better. It's what makes them good, but it's also a, an effing beast that you have to deal with. And that's why um, I so, so much of your channel is resonant because you with people because you talk about that voice. Yeah. And I think that's, I think it was Struthless maybe who did a video on that. I think it was called the dark why. And I think that's a thing people don't address enough in life is like, yeah, you have to, like I said, you know, you have to be willing to fail and you have to learn to fail the right way, but you also have to be willing to like understand the idea. Like in my case, I have a lot of anger over a lot of things. And that's been a thing throughout like my whole life. And I have a lot of, you know, anxiety and like dealing with depression and things like that. But at the same time, it's like, those are the things that allow me to push forward with it because like if you I can't remember the analogy from the Struthless video but I think it's something to the effect of if you want to start your car and you don't have your keys you just hot wire it you know and I think that's the thing is like I can use that frustration at my own work and at my own limits of my abilities to make me push through you know those that 12th hour edit where like 
a client needs another stupid revision over something that doesn't matter. And I'm so pissed off that like, I want to write that email that's like, you're an idiot. I'm out. Give me my money, whatever. That's the thing that pushes me through that. Yeah. And I think that's, it's a really powerful driving force. There was like a great interview with uh, Maynard Keenan. And I, I think it was in a, a, a video. I, I don't remember if it was, it was about a perfect circle or Pussifer or the wine documentary he did. I don't know. But anyways, there's like an interview somewhere out there with Maynard Keenan. And uh, it, it was this really interesting concept that stuck out to me as a teenager where he said, um, and paraphrasing a bit here, it's been like a you know while since I watched this, but he said something like, when I'm writing a lot of lyrics and thinking about a lot of these things, you know, he, he has this projection, which we all do, which I think that's what works so well, you know, on YouTubers is like, I, I saw a comment about me that like my facial hair looks like I have a, a wiener going up my nose in nicer words. And like, that's fine. You know, it's that, that's that projection we're, we're hating something on someone else because of whatever. And he said lyrically in a lot of his songs, there's something about that where there's that projection of like, I'm angry at you. And, you are the reason that everything sucks and your, you know, your hatred is what wears me down. But he was like, if you turn those statements around into phrasing it as I, you know, that's where a lot of interesting ideas start to emerge. And I think that's a, yeah. a good tool to use as an artist, but it is something that like strikes a very sometimes kind of scary balance. <laughs> so like, yeah, maintaining your mental health is very, very important. <laughs> Otherwise you go insane. And that's like why I value my gym membership so much <laughs> is like, that is my time that forces me to like, I am done. I have to go for an hour and lift weights and get sweaty and gross and run, you know, something like that. Sometimes I just go run for five miles because <laughs> that's just what you do. And that's a huge part of maintaining that. But it's that, you know, meditative, reflective time that is very, very helpful to like start pushing you forward. When you were starting to talk about anger, I was really getting ready to whisper into my mic, you need jujitsu, Cameron. Right. <laughs> it has been, it has been, because before I did jujitsu, I'd gotten back into strength training and doing the big compound lifts and all that stuff. I'd started to get a little bit of a case of dad bod after, um, you know, the, the daughter was born and I got back into lifting. And at a certain point I said, what am I training for? You know, right. I was into this idea of getting a bigger deadlift, bigger squat, bigger bench. And I'm like, but what for? Like, what's the purpose of it? You know, uh, mu much respect to the people who can lift thousand pounds off the ground and are setting world records in the deadlift. For me as a sport, it's boring. This is not to say that it's not awesome that there are people doing it. It's awesome that there are people doing it. But like, what am I getting strong for? For what activity? And for one person, it could be hiking. For someone, it could be kayaking. It could be, but I needed that for, and jujitsu became that. And it has, for me, been one of the best anger management tools, period. Yeah. When you get to spend an hour every day strangling your friends, just your desire to strangle everyone else just drops dramatically. <laughs> so my only concern about That's, recommending jujitsu- That should be the tagline like, for jujitsu. <laughs> strangle your friends so you don't want to strangle everyone else. Exactly. Exactly. So the, my only hesitance is that if you do, if I recommend this to someone like yourself who can sometimes be driven by your negative side, it's like you still need a little bit of that negative side if you want yeah. to be propelled forward. And I have to oh, admit, totally, yeah. it, it was a big thing when I was younger. Like one of the reasons that I started writing and interviewing and doing videos and, you know, at its peak, Sonic Scoop was probably read a quarter million times a month and had, you know, maybe 350,000 monthly views on YouTube in addition to that. And, you know, it was, it was fairly big. And I've let it, you know, dwindle a tiny bit more, but our revenues haven't dwindled because I focused more on like what moves the needle rather than just right. getting views. So I, I kind of changed that balance. But um, one of the, th man, I got totally distracted by my, uh, <laughs> my own impressiveness. Oh my goodness. But one of the things that allowed me to control, let me back up. One of the things that drove me to do that in the beginning was anger. Like I hated gear sluts. I literally hated gear oh, sluts. Yeah, I, I thought it was destroying music and music production angry. and people's psyches, <laughs> making people for, uh, focus on the wrong thing. And that hatred and anger drew me to create something that I thought was better. And that's a great impetus, but I don't know if it's sustainable long term. So I think at a certain point, you need love and enjoyment and puzzle to keep going. Like people, totally. after yeah. they start because of that anger, you need a puzzle that's fun for you to do every day. And you need love and the idea that you're actually helping people. So I'm driven more by those things now, um, which makes me want to win less 
on metrics and it makes me want to beat people less, which is why I beat people less. But it also <laughs> makes me more satisfied doing what I'm doing. Because when I shill for mixing breakthroughs like every week, it's not just so I can make money to pay my mortgage. It's because like the feedback I get from it is literally people say, oh my God, I literally got better at mixing overnight because I did this. And like, right. this is not like a gimmick like, oh, do this and you'll get better at mixing overnight. It's like people literally do because what I'm giving them is not only this repeatable process and some tricks and techniques, I'm giving them confidence and I'm giving them a path to have confidence in themselves. And I've seen it change people's lives. And I've seen the before and afters of their mixes like dramatically improve. And I know that the way that I helped them do that was by helping them improve their mind and emotional health to a degree. And this is why I can show for it all the time because I feel like I've seen it help people. It's the same reason like I feel comfortable charging people for mastering because I do mastering for them. I can hear it sounds better and I can hear they take what I did and their next mix sounds better because of it. So that idea of having like love and wanting to help people drives me more now, but like I could have never gotten to this place if I didn't have the anger early on. And, yeah, and when in your life does it switch over? I don't know. But um, jujitsu was helpful in, in having me switch it over at some point. Um, but I, I can't necessarily recommend reducing anger to everyone at every stage in their lives because it's a, it's a necessary emotion. There's no emotion we have that isn't right. necessary at some point. I, I think it's kind of, you know, further to your point there. Yeah, it's like it, it's that part that kickstarts the the wheel of like inspiration and action where people and I, I think I talked about that at one point in the video was just like, especially in creative careers, whatever it is that you're doing, you're always kind of stuck, like thinking that, you know, the muse will speak or whatever. But the better you get at developing that sense of action of just like starting something, the more you build that kind of ground for inspiration to take place. And I think that's something, you know, I deal with all the time, like, you know, like that game score, it was just days where I'm like, I don't know what to make. So I just start throwing down stuff. And sometimes like, then something picks up and I, I might delete everything I had, but like, then I get an idea. And I think that's where that dark why thing comes in of just, yeah, that anger, that frustration, that depression, that anxiety, whatever can be the thing that kickstarts something more productive. And it's learning to harness that. I think that also kind of like you said, helps you, or I guess kind of branching off what you said, it, that's the thing that helps you learn to love that process. You know, because it's like, you know, making my videos or something. Sometimes they're about pretty dark and angry things. So I have to get in that mood. But it's like I also really enjoy what I'm doing. And I, you know, kind of like you said, I've seen the feedback that like it does really help people. So as much as it sucks to like pull myself back down into that place, there's something about that whole mental gymnastics that's really exciting and interesting to me. And then being able to like adapt that to video is fascinating. <laughs> So I think, yeah, it's like it's, it, yeah, you have to learn to use it as the match that lights the fire, so to speak, and not the fire itself. Right. That's a beautiful way of putting it. Um, one last thing I'd say in this whole uh, uh, can of worms you opened here uh, around the idea of both anger and about being annoyed about there's certain things that you'd love to do that you can't do on your channel. It's a tricky thing because as an artist, you occasionally have to do things that are more for your own development than for the audience's enjoyment. And mm -hmm. sometimes those things hit and sometimes they don't. But yep. sometimes things that get fewer views can potentially be more valuable to the core members of your audience and things that get I, more uh, views. Yeah. And like, I, I guess I won't share like the exact numbers because I don't know if he'd be cool with it. But anyways, um, Ben, Jordan, and I, we went on that cave video trip. I don't know if you saw that one. We went to this cave yeah. system way down in Georgia. It was crazy. Mm -hmm. And uh, yeah, man, uh, that was a big video. Holy shit. That was terabytes of footage and just editing, editing, editing. And like I had this really and I'm really happy with how that video turned out. Like I love that video so much. And God, just <laughs> like day one, it hits. Eh, it's like doing okay, you know, like yep. six out of 10. It's like, ah, uh, you know, and it was like, I think it was maybe the week before Thanksgiving or something, but like it was doing average, which like was kind of like, damn it, fine, like, okay. And then it was like within 24 hours, it just like sloped hard. Like YouTube killed that video. So immediately I'm like, it's the algorithm. God damn it. Blah, 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 blah. And it's just that the audience didn't care. 
You know, that's how YouTube works. If you put out a video and you see it slope, it might go really, really well. Like I've had videos that, you know, pop off with 100,000 views in like four days. But then you just get this like, boom, like hard, you know, hard clipping peak limiter. Like, uh -uh, that's it. That's all the views you get. And you get so mad because you're like, God, I've been algorithm blacklisted. I'm an algorithm jail. YouTube is working against me. It's because I said shit somewhere in the video. You know, like you develop this right. mindset that like, but it's just that, you know, when it hit that audience, then it stopped because there was only that audience that really cared. So that cave video, six out of 10 or whatever, wasn't doing great. I was like, I'll accept it. It's a weird video. It's doing average, fine. And then, yeah, it just died. It immediately went down to 10 out of 10 and it was like exceptionally below my normal performance. It, it's the almost the most likely to happen to the things you love the most. And that's been my experience. That is the video far and away I made the most money off of. Interesting. Ben and I both, yeah, did really, really well off that video because only, you know, only 20,000 people watched it or whatever, which like pissed me off. But, but a lot of those people went rate? out. Well, all the, a lot of those people that watched it, we recorded the impulse response pack from the cave. Right. So a lot of people watched it and went and bought that. Beautiful. So, you know, you multiply whatever it was, 20,000 views across both of our videos. So, you know, 40, 50,000 views times whatever percentage actually went out and bought the thing. It's like, I made out better than, on that than I do in like a year of YouTube. I, so, I totally you know, views it. and metrics and shit aren't everything at all. You have uh, discovered what is basically my business model on YouTube, uh, Cameron, because my business model on YouTube is there's a lot of people out there who want a seven minute light bite video and I'm not the best person to give it to them because I just don't, I don't want to. I do right. not want to be streaky. I'm glad that streaky exists. I don't want to be streaky. I don't want to do like a super tight, like an edit every other second. Um, here's right. a quick tip where we're going to look in the DAW together. It's just, I'm not, I'm not the right guy to do it. But I get to tell all of those people at the beginning of the video, go away. This isn't for right. you. This is for someone who wants to get And that's kind of my philosophy like too, is just if you don't like it and you don't get it and you think I'm an obnoxious, hipster, self-important douche, then like, yes, bye. Like the video is not for you. <laughs> I don't care. Exactly. It does, like it does not weigh on me and it does not concern me. <laughs> but, yep. you know, yeah, it's like when you do, especially what you're doing and like some of the other smaller like production channels out there I've seen that come up lately, you know, where they've only got 10, 20,000 subscribers or whatever. Mm -hmm. They make some insanely good content that's, you know, really, really powerful. But, you know, you're doing stuff that only, you know, like, I guess in your case, whatever, like 10,000 views per video, let's say. You're doing stuff that only 10,000 people care about. But those 10,000 people really care about it. It's exactly. And that's a lot more valuable than getting a million views every video. Yeah. You know, it's it's the and, same thing of like a music career where it's like the the Kevin Kelly thing. If you have a thousand true fans, that's better than 50,000 people that like loosely care about what you're doing. Yeah. And it can be surprisingly lucrative like you found on that um video with the caves is that there was a product that made sense for that type of content and that type of person who was going to resonate with. So I'm purposely attracting people who want to hear someone talk about audio stuff for an hour. These are the types of people who buy courses. People who right. want seven minute quick fix videos aren't the kinds of people who want to buy an epic course on compression that teaches them everything about compression, uh, how to use on every single instrument, like putting to bed, like all the myths and like going super nerdy and then coming back out at the end saying, we've gone through all of this. Now let's reestablish what are the core principles and the things that actually matter. Now that you know all the nerdy stuff, let's throw the nerdy stuff away and go back to the core principles, which are these. And let's hear some stuff. That's compression breakthroughs. You can get 30 day money back guarantee, blah, blah, blah. But, but that's the, the idea is that I kind of like that cave video is every video that I try to do and, and why I do things the way I do. But just one quick yeah, and example. It was a super on the other. important lesson for both of us because we were both yep. so pissed off at the performance of that video. But then we were like, oh, yeah. so like the video did garbage, but like not really. <laughs> it seems like it's a total win. You made a piece of art that you love right. and you made money for doing it and you didn't have to deal with annoying comments from like the people who would never get it because they just didn't show up. Right. It's like a win exactly. on so many fronts. So one quick example I want to give uh, for my own life. I want to let you go because we're going even longer than I expected here, although I, I really appreciate your time. I did That's a video fun. once um, that I think is a good example of this. There's a podcast episode called Rich Kids in the Music Industry. And that was one of my favorite videos to do it's, it was probably like an eight out of 10 or seven out of 10, like not for those of you who aren't YouTubers, it means like it's not you know one of the highest performing videos. 
But the amount of comments I get that, in that video is like almost everyone who has watched it has commented, it feels like, because they're, right. they're all just like, Justin, I needed to hear this. Because I get it. I came from, my parents were public school teachers. Um, they We weren't like wealthy by, you know, normal. We weren't wealthy by looking at Instagram today, American standards. But of course, yeah. everyone <laughs> in America is wealthy by like world standards and history standards. So we have to put that into context. And there's so much angst sometimes that people have about the only reason they're successful musicians and I'm not is because they're rich and right. they were born wealthy. And that is something I've heard from so many people in music production and in art and in music. And I think it's one of the most unhealthy things I've heard. And I would say the two biggest things, Cameron, for me, you've touched on one of the biggest things that holds people back from success in music is cowardice. Like the fear of being themselves and just getting out there and completing. But the other big thing is envy and resentment is the other yeah. huge thing that I've seen as being one of the biggest stumbling blocks for anybody. Well, that's a huge um, part too. Like I, I know a couple of people, um, obviously not going to name them, but like I, I've worked with a couple of people, uh, who, yeah, I mean, super, super talented at what they do on like composition and sound design and things like that. And, you know, being someone who's done a lot of these things, I was like, you know, Hey, like, I'll, let, let, let's make some connections, you know, like I, let me introduce you to some of these companies. Cause I think you could do something cool. But yeah, like they're just assholes and that's a very <laughs> big mistake because like they're, they're either kind of like, yeah, that sort of entitled self-important thing where they're like, I'm super talented and I know it. And it's like, that's really not an attitude to have. And I think that's, yeah, cowardice is a big one, but yeah, just like learning to be the person that you want to get a beer with. Yeah. Infinitely more valuable skill than like raw talent, <laughs> like being someone who is agreeable and can work in a team-based environment. That's and branding too. Like, I think that's another huge thing of like, I've a lot of these same people who are like kind of jerks, same thing. Where I'm like, you know, hey, not to be that guy, but like, you know, your logo sucks, your website's kind of jank. You know, you really need to like come up with a mood here. Like, you gotta sell. Cameron speaking right? directly to me right now for anyone who's not paying attention. Right. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's like, you know, one of those things where it's like, man, you know, like, graphics and stuff are important and like having a nice kind of catchy website is good and whatever. And you know, they just don't think so. And it's like, I, I can't stress enough how much it can benefit you to look like the person who should get the job. Yeah. Even if you aren't necessarily like the perfect candidate, if you look like you're the person to do that job, you look like the right person for the gig, you will get the gig every single time and i've seen that like time and time again and and you know and yeah that's part of that thing of resentment or whatever you're just like oh it's just because they have it's just because he has a lot of subscribers and really good camera shots he sucks at music it's oh it's just because he you know whatever you know you look at someone else oh it's just because they spent twenty thousand dollars on a trident console that their mixes sound good blah blah blah, blah do you blah, know blah, how blah. many people like have spent millions of dollars on studios who have them sitting open. I remember one of my friends, Joel right. Hamilton, once said to me, Justin, the most depressing thing in the world is walking into a studio that looks like it's just ready for Beyonce to walk in at any moment and it right. never has any clients. <laughs> and you Instagram know how studio. many of those there are in the world? Like the world does not need another recording studio. There's a lot of people who thought that they could buy their way in to the world of art. And like, you actually can't. You have to have more no, than money. Yeah. Not to say that money doesn't help. Like every asset that you can have in life helps, whether it's good looks or an extremely deep and engaging voice or whatever it might right. be. <laughs> um, these assets help, but none of them get you everything that you need by themselves. Hey, I want to ask a, a quick question. We're, we're running out of time here. We're going over. I really appreciate you spending so much time with us. There's one last question, since we're talking about the emotional side of art that I want to ask you about. One thing I've noticed in a few of your videos I haven't watched all of your videos, but a surprisingly high percentage of the ones that I have watched, you have quoted your father in them. Yeah. <laughs> can you tell me two things? One, can you tell us anything about your father and what role he played in your life? That's number one. And I'm going to ask a second question after you, you've told me that. Yeah. Uh, so dad was army guy. I mean, a lot of my family was like ex-military. Uh, so he yeah, was army guy growing up and I always thought that was like super, super cool. Um, but of course, you know, he was very like GI Joe about everything, a lot of discipline, a lot of like, you know, quit your goddamn cry and just do it. <laughs> yeah. Things like that. Which, I see you know, that today, some of that has reached you for sure. Yeah. Today in hindsight, like maybe some of the parenting methods I disagree with, but like it was the nineties, <laughs> <You know, laughs> we, we were fine. We threw pine cones at each other. It was great. <laughs> mm -hmm. Um, 
Yeah. And then my dad, uh, after the army, he started his own business. Um, so that was kind of cool. Uh, he, he basically started like a Best Buy before Best Buy was like a thing. Um, it never like franchised or anything. It was just like a local business where he sold like electronics and, uh, you know, appliances and things like that. And he did like appliance repair. So it worked out really, really well. Um, then we moved and my parents split up. So, you know, like divorce is not good for finances and whatever. So we, mm -hmm. Yeah, that was a pretty rough period um, and moved around just a ton. Uh, but my dad then got a job doing uh, electronics stuff again, uh, working in like repairing fire alarms and security systems and things like that. Uh, so he did that. And then we moved back uh, to where I originally was from back in like central Illinois. And uh he got another job doing the same sort of thing and then worked his way back up. So then my dad went from being like a maintenance worker to now he uh, currently is like the head of a facilities job for like a major hospital system. And he also now works for the government, like surveying hospitals. Mm -hmm. So like, yeah, he's a pretty badass dude. And yeah, a lot of important things about just learning like, yeah, you know, self-reliance and self-sufficiency and just like, you know, like one of the things I remember dad said, like about the army stuff was trust your equipment. You know what I mean? Like if, if you're going to jump out of an airplane, you can't be scared that your parachute is not going to catch you. Mm -hmm. Right. And yeah, you know, just like stuff of, cause he, you know, and he was good with his hands. So repairing stuff, you know, just do it yourself, just figure it out. It's not yeah. that hard. You know, <laughs> things are so set up away for a reason. musical in your family, he had that interest in kind of electronics and equipment. Which yeah, uh, he actually played guitar and stuff. Uh, he was in a band uh, like back in the 80s or whatever. And, you know, he still plays today. Him and my stepmom go play little gigs at uh, like local bars and stuff, which is pretty cool. Um, but my great grandpa was a musician back in like the 50s and 60s, which I don't know if it shows up here, but like back behind me there, there's some records. Mm hmm which I have yet to hang up because I'm lazy, but uh, those are my great grandpa's records that he recorded. And I actually have his guitar over there too. Um, so he was like the musician in my family who actually like went and had like a music career. But yeah, dad played in a band. Uh, Stepmom was a musician too. So growing up after they got married, like we had a little like family band thing where I played shows with them and stuff. So it was pretty cool. But yeah, like dad's full of a lot of wisdom and a lot of one-liners. <laughs> yeah, it seems like... Now, here's the second question I'm going to piggyback on, because one of the other things I've discovered in mu musicians universally, in addition to these uh, two things that hold them back and potentially drive them forward, there's this third thing, which is I almost feel like all musicians I've met, whether they're successful or not, but uh, especially the successful ones, is that they almost seem to be playing out a degree of parental expectation that has led them yeah. to invest themselves and couple their identity with music so much. Tell me, you guys in the chat and in the comments, if you uh, felt this at all, because I just see this in a lot of musicians, that they f that part of what they're doing with their music career is almost this, I don't think kids actually rebel with music. They might rebel with music by being into a slightly different type of music than their parents right. expected, but almost always there is a parent who they subconsciously think that they are pleasing by being involved in music. And it's one of the things that tethers them to music. I don't know if this is true for everyone in music, but it comes up remarkably often as like yeah, a deep-rooted thing. Yeah, I think so. Because like, you know, I remember that as a kid where my dad, you know, when I first got into music, he would show me like how to play a song and things like that. And then I remember watching, I, I distinctly remember this. I don't know why. We were on vacation in Hawaii. And that was around the time the movie School of Rock came out. If you remember that one, classic. Like, I love that movie. Mm -hmm. Uh, there's the, the big guitar solo at the end, the kid, Zach, whatever. Um, and I remember it was my mom saying, you know, that could be you. And I thought that was mm. kind of cool, you know? And then I remember, and then, you know, like growing up teenager playing in bands, whatever, you know, played at like the local bars doing that with my stepbrother. Uh, eventually we played at like a festival, like a, you know, little County fair thing that we played. And yeah, it was one of those things. And I remember my dad saying things of like, oh man, you know, you're really into like the, the blues and the grunge and whatever. And he was like, what if you, you know, what if you combine those two? So I kind of worked at that. And yeah, and I think it is sort of like, I don't know, not necessarily trying to please that, but you know, just to work towards, yeah, that expectation. I remember my uncle, uh, who passed away a couple years ago. Um, 
you know, he was always a big thing for me, like showing me music and whatever. And he was always like super encouraging of me being like into the music thing. Cause like, you know, dad, of course, you know, he's my daddy. He, he wants his kids to be, you know, happy and successful. So like seeing that, like, dad, I'm going to go into the music industry. <laughs> my dad was like, that's a stupid idea. <laughs> At least like, you know, he wasn't outright like that, but he was like, you know, have a backup plan, man. Like, let's be realistic. Um, but yeah, my uncle was always super encouraging with that, which like, you know, that was a big thing. So it was kind of just like trying to fulfill the thing I saw in my head that like, I knew if I just worked harder, I could do it. And I think that's very much like the, what is it? The Myers-Briggs test that uh, I think whatever my wife found, my wife was very into psychology. That's what she went to school for. Uh, INTJ is my like archetype or whatever. Sure. And I think, that's Oh, you a are such a classic it INTJ. It's obvious. You look yeah. like an INTJ before you even open your mouth. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So, you know, that was a big thing is just like the architect and trying to like build up into this expectation I had. And I think something that summed it up really beautifully, I was watching a video a couple of weeks ago, I think, or maybe a week or two ago from Van Neistat. He's the brother of uh, Casey Neistat. If you're not familiar with this channel, great channel, right. phenomenal storyteller. Um, very big influence on my own channel. And uh, he had this video about his son where it was called, um, I, I can't remember what it was called, think like a child, act like a man, something along those lines. And there was this line in it where he said, uh, the debt we owe to our parents, we pay unto our children. Mm. And I was like, that's, that's a really good way of phrasing it. And like, I don't have kids, obviously, but I think like, that's where a lot of that fundamental expectation comes from. And, you know, living that out of like, I, you know, I want to be what my dad meant to me and whatever. And like, I don't have kids. So it's like, in my case, it's, you know, being reliable, being whatever. And, you know, being, and, and, you know, playing that into like, you know, what I want to be for my wife, what I want to be for my audience. And I think that's my, you know, that's my paying it unto my children <laughs> is like yeah. pushing that into everything that I do. And yeah, well, and a lot of that is, you know, army guy, like, just get it done, damn it. <laughs> yeah, uh, this, a lot of this makes sense, you know, because I definitely get a sense of uh, discipline and respect for routine and rit uh, ritual from you and the um, uh, expecting technology to serve you. Like, uh, all these things make a lot of sense. I want to let you go because we've taken so long. We've had literally hundreds of comments come in here, but it's well, mostly good. people <laughs> commenting on what we're saying rather than asking questions. While you were well, telling the story, I had one eye on the chat here, and the only two questions I could really uh, see were, here's a super boring one, uh, what's that mic you're using, Cameron? Is that a Sonarworks measurement mic was the question? Uh, yes. <laughs> cool. It's one oh, of my, wow. I, I'm, pretty sure, I'm pretty sure it's the Sonarworks one. Uh, so we we yeah. have a savvy viewership here uh, on the channel, Cameron. The other one was, uh, let me see, there was a, a question in here. I had it, but I just lost it because a new comment in and it's, oh, here it is. Dan Mess asked, question for Cameron. What app do you use for collecting slash pinning research? I saw a cool pic of yours on Twitter slash IG oh, recently. Oh, yeah, yeah. Needed that app for my most recent video on music bias. <laughs> yeah. Oh, it's a good one. Uh, it's called Millinote. I'll type it in the chat here. This is, I, I could not live my life without this. Um, so Millinote is like, it's kind of like Evernote or like Google keep or, you know, uh, what's the Apple one, the notes, Pat, notepad, I don't know, whatever. Anyways, um, it's a really cool, like organization system that's based around like creative work. So it has presets for like small business and presets for like a video production template where like, you know, there's sub boards for like storyboard assets, you know, checklists, and you can have all of that stuff, like a notes list links to research, you know, drawings, like little clip art drawings you can draw in with the pencil tool and whatever, but you can have it all on one screen at one time and just like, oh my God, that's so helpful for video projects and like client projects too. All my client work goes through there of like, you know, scoring stuff or sound design or whatever. It's links to like the drive box that I, or the drop box that I'm dropping all the production assets to. It's links to the music. It's links to the references. It's an outline. It's a checklist and it's all just on one big board. Yeah, it is a lifesaver. Good stuff. And it's like, well, it, it, the free version gives you like a hundred projects or whatever, a hundred boards or whatever it calls it. Um, but the paid version is like, not bad at all. And it's unlimited. So like, it's totally, totally worth it. If you're into any like creative production stuff, it's the best like organization system I found so far. All right. Check it out, people. This seems like a genuine endorsement to me. Uh, apparently, he won't be doing uh, a video on them on his channel because no. it will eat away his soul. But 
uh, you got the endorsement here. So uh, last uh, quick thing here is I want to give uh, you a chance to tell people where to find you, all that stuff. You're pretty easy to find, but I want uh, people to be right. able to also <laughs> clue into some of the other stuff that you might be doing beyond your YouTube channel, which we'll have linked here. Uh, last quick shout outs I want to give our uh, big thanks to other sponsors for this month. I'll have to mention the intro and post uh, is Sound Toys. They're sponsoring this month, making some of my favorite creative mixing oh, effects yeah. in the universe. Oh, yeah. man. Nice. Trout, anything they make for free for 30 days over at soundtoys.com. And actually, right now, um, they're actually doing a flood relief thing. There was some huge, massive flooding in Vermont where they are. And all sales of Sound Toys plugins right now are going to nonprofits to help with flood relief uh, in Vermont, uh, right where those guys are. So check them out, soundtoys.com. They make great stuff. Uh, if you want to help support this podcast, best things you can do are check out the full-length courses, compression breakthroughs, mixing breakthroughs, mastering demystified, all of them guaranteed to change the way you work forever for the better, or your money back. And you can also become a member of this channel. It is ridiculously cheap. It's five bucks a month. You click the join button down at the bottom and you get access to uh, monthly Q and A's and mixed feedback sessions with me. where We can give you fe specific feedback in real time, not just for me, but also from the other community members on exactly what's working in your mix and what your lowest hanging fruit is for improving things even further. So check that out. Just click the join button on any Sonic Scoop video. So Cameron, what are the best places for people to check you out? Obviously you have the Venus Theory YouTube. If you're on YouTube, just type in Venus Theory. You'll get them fast. But uh, any other main things besides the YouTube channel we should check out? Uh, venustheory.com is my website. That's got links to like all my other stuff that I'm not going to remember offhand here. Uh, and then venustheory.com. What's the social media that you're most active on in case people want you outside of YouTube? Uh, none of them. <laughs> <laughs> I'm terrible about it. I have, I have a Discord you could find if you go to my channel. Uh, I sometimes go in there when I feel like it. Um, yeah, I'm terrible about social media. And then I've got my band camp for music stuff. And then if you like sampled instruments or whatever, I've got a bunch of my own sampled instruments, which are on the decent sampler store, decent samples.com or on my gum road page, which is, I'm going to say it's Venus I'm going to guess that that's it. It might not be. Uh, these are things I probably should know, but yeah, you know, <laughs> Google me and you'll find it. Be self-sufficient. You're, you're a big kid. You got it. All right. Type the Venus theories into all the search bars of all the things and you'll find Venus theory stuff. Cameron, thanks so much for being on the channel. I am a, uh, a fan, a enjoyer of the channel, and it was great having a conversation with you. I really like the way you think, and I'm so glad you could share some of your insights with our audience. Yeah. Thanks for having me. All right. Thank you guys for hanging out with us. This has been Justin Coletti of Sonic Scoop. See you next time.